So good morning, everyone. Also from my side, my name is Sasha Pavlic, and I'm coming from University of Maribor. And together with our colleagues, uh, we did the following work with Sasha Karakatic and Isto Kister. Uh, the name is Nianet, a framework for constructing autoencoder architectures using nature-inspired algorithms. Um, first, I would like to make an introduction, like what is the problem that we have been researching? So as we might know, we live in a world where the data science is becoming more and more important. Uh, since each data and the patterns that are following are making available information for our civilization. So same holds true also in medicine, especially in healthcare, where it's becoming important to understand the patient data so that the doctor can make better, uh, let's say, prediction for a specific patient, how to make a treatment and so on. So in our work, we have decided that we are going to explore uh, the disease diabetes, which is sadly a chronic disease, and it's making a great threat to uh, human health. Uh, so here we have been interested mainly uh, to check uh, how is it done with machine learning, how we can predict it, uh, and that will also help uh, doctors to make better decisions, analyze the patient, and so on. So before we move forward, we wanted to check the current situation in the literature, uh, which machine learning algorithms are applied, how they are working, and so on. Here on the left side, I have listed a few of them, uh, but when going over the ongoing challenges, we figured out that there are still some issues with mostly acquiring the data samples, but since they can come from various sources. Uh, there's also a problem of uh, understanding the patterns that they're showing to us with the mentioned methods. Uh, it's also difficult to choose uh, appropriate classificators for each of the data sets. And then it also comes down to a problem of uh, decision which features to take, uh, how to reduce the dimensionality of data. So with that, we came to the uh, following one that we had an idea uh, and associated challenge, which was, OK, what if we are going to use the autoencoders? Since they are designed in a way that they can reduce the complexity of the data uh, in a way how they operate. And not only that, they can also be used um, the, during the training and then the testing phase. They kind of isolate the noise from the data. Uh, which could be said that they are actually correcting the data. Um, and an extension to this, uh, in a way how they operate, they also produce, let's say, the available uh, space, uh, which is the reduced in dimensionality of the input data. And this can be later used in, like, let's say, like machine learning pipeline uh, that we establish, uh, let's say, this uh, knowledge and we pass it to some other uh, model. Uh, but we also bump up into the problem of constructing the autoencoders, since, as you might know, they're also uh, in a field of uh, neural networks. So they have associated problems uh, that they are difficult to train, uh, both, uh, let's say, from um, human um, perspective and also computational power. And, and the problem is also that, that uh, it's limited mostly by human experts. So they have some clear knowledge and experience, and they need to apply it uh, for various applications, which are, of course, from task to task different. And uh, to continue, there's also a huge, vast search space. Uh, since we need to like set up the topology of autoencoders, and we then need to form the um, appropriate hyperparameters. With that, we came to the uh, following challenge, which was how to set up the topology of autoencoders. Uh, as we might know, they are mostly built from two parts. One is encoder and another is decoder, where encoder tries to uh, take the initial data, uh, tries to learn the representation in lower dimension, and then pass it back to decoder, which is trying to do the mirrored work. So to decode it back to the original, where we can then check the input and the reconstructed input. Uh, so here was the challenge. Okay, if we take the and call and call their part how many hidden uh, layers are going to be there, what type are they going to be, uh, what is going to be the association with the folder, is it going to be asymmetrical or symmetrical, what is going to be the size of bottleneck, and so on. And once the topology is set, there's also another challenge of setting up the hyperparameters. Here I have listed a few of them, 
but in real world there are many of them and they influence the, success, the final success of auto encoder. Uh, so if I recap, the present challenge would be something like that, that you have a specific application that you need or want to do, uh, but in order to do that, you need to manually set the topology and hyperparameters for that particular auto encoder. Issues coming with that, and the first one that we can, uh, let's say, uh, demonstrate are that this is for any human uh, machine learning expert, a very complex task since it's influenced by its previous experience. And not only that, because the data is becoming more and more complex, uh, he or she also needs to have a understanding uh, of that particular data set in order to make, uh, let's say, a good product. Uh, so from that, we come to our main question, which was, what if manually setting up the uh, architecture of autoencoders is anyway um, inappropriate? Because what we found out in multiple papers was uh, that mostly there, are, there is no guideline how to set up, uh, let's say, topology and then the hyperparameter. Uh, you mostly need to go by trial and error, test what, it, what is working, what is not. And our solution to that problem was um, if we could use nature intelligence that would uh, find us to help the best autoencoder for a given data set. With that, we come to our proposed method, NeoNet, uh, which is uh, built up on top of NeoPy, which is a collection of all the nature inspired algorithms which can be used. And uh, the, let's say the three characteristics designing our uh, presenting our method are that it's capable of exploring the search space. In this case, the autoencoder architecture, uh, topology and hyperparameter separately. And once it's, uh, let's say, explored, it's uh, trying to build the, uh, the autoencoder uh, from the encoder and decoder part together to form the autoencoder. And it's doing this in an iterative process where it's selecting the optimal solution based on some fitness uh, criteria, which can be uh, manually changed or adapted for a given uh, data set. But for each operation, it needs an, a numerical data set. Uh, in our example, it was a diabetes data set and some initial parameters. So just, let's say, uh, make the borders of the search space where it's gonna uh, search for optimal solution. Uh, if I, uh, let's say, make a quick overview, will be something that uh, the method is capable of adopting to a given data set and designing the uh, autoencoder architecture for it. Uh, with, uh, with this, it's also using the nature intelligence for problem optimization. Uh, the main goal was to make like a sans free approach, uh, which will work in a, uh, let's say in that way that we are presenting it. Uh, to have an idea where to put the, our method in the aspect of uh, automated machine learning, will be between the model generation and model evaluation. So basically it's uh, like receiving some solution proposed by NeoPy framework, uh, where it's trying to map the value to a corresponding autoencoder. And then from there it's taken uh, to, a, let's say, a model initialization and then evaluation phase. Science is iterated process is trying to do this uh, by iteration until we get appropriate solution. Uh, so here I also presented a more detailed uh, representation of how the solution is formed. It's basically a one-dimensional array with seven elements, where the three, uh, first three one are representing the topology, where we are taking uh, the topology shape, which can be asymmetric or asymmetrical. Uh, second one is new and droppage and layer, simply referring to how many uh, less neurons are there from the initial uh, layer. Uh, and number of layers is how many of them are going to be in encoder and decoder part. Then the last four, one are representing the hyperparameters for which we decided to go for uh, activation function, uh, which is, a, let's say, a list of possible options, number of epochs, which is a range, the same holds true with learning rate, and the last one is the optimizer. So once we got like this array of, uh, let's say, values, we try to map it to a PyTorch model. Here I have also presenting, presented a pseudocode and a diagram showing uh, the entire workflow of our method. 
and it, I could describe it so that in the beginning it requires the data set and parameter set both for our method and the one that we are using for nature and forest algorithm, NIAPI. And from that, it tries to initialize the all needed dependencies and uh, where it's trying to iterate over uh, the generation, where it first receives the solution from algorithm. So here we decided to go to for five algorithms. I'm going to show them later. And then what it's doing is actually mapping the values from this solution array from the previous slide to a corresponding uh, uh, values of out and polar, such as shape, layer step, layers, and so on. Once this is uh, completed uh, or ended by a certain criteria, it tries to get the best solution from the uh, population and then returns the best model. Uh, for testing or our method, we have also conducted an experiment where we used a relatively simple data set of uh, diabetes, uh, which had 10 features. Uh, all the values were numerical and prior to usage, we standardized them. Uh, for parameter setting, uh, since it's the uh, next uh, needed step for our method, we set the problem dimension to seven, which is the same as the solution array that I presented before. Population size was set to default uh, for a particular algorithm that is finding the solution. Uh, where we had five algorithms with uh, 100 evaluations and two runs. Below, we can also find the fitness function that we used uh, because we have been interesting to build the out encoder, which has a low reconstruction loss, uh, but it's also, uh, let's say, simple um, in terms of topology and hyperparameters. So this is referred to as a complexity. Uh, and here in fitness function, we wanted to minimize the problem that the best model has the lower value. Uh, on the next slide, we can see the results uh, that are presented uh, from the five different algorithms from where the particle swarm optimization uh, reached uh, the best fitness value, which was significantly better than others. Uh, but to understand the results, we can look also in the first part where the topology is presented. Uh, we can see how all of the algorithms came up so nearly identical solution. But when we are talking about hyperparameters, we can see that they have uh, proposed different uh, solutions uh, for hyperparameters. Uh, from our understanding, this was uh, because uh, our method found like uh, a good topology for a given data set, but uh, hyperparameters were still something west in the search that the method tried to search. But during those iterations, uh, it came to the following result. Uh, if we want to look into, let's say, analyzing the fittest solution found by our method, it's presented here. It's a symmetrical out encoder, uh, which re uh, received the 10 dimensional vector, and it tried to uh, compress it uh, to eight dimensional vector by encoder. And since it's symmetrical, the decoder is just a mirror version of encoder, which takes uh, the latent vector and tried to uh, decode it back to a reconstructed input. Uh, Hyperparameters for that particular uh, autoencoder are also listed here. And as I mentioned before, was discovered by particle form optimization. Uh, so our finding conclusion to, uh, from our work would be the following, and that the method uh, is like opening um, not new doors or uh, new ideas uh, for following challenges uh, where we would like to extend our work in future to open uh, to uh, search for more topologies, hyperparameters, and to also test our methods on different methods where we can uh, later on compare it with, with the methods uh, uh, that are the best for the given data set. At the end, we could say uh, that uh, our method was uh, performing relatively well if we consider that it's working without any manual intervention. Um, so we believe that with a few more papers down the line, there are going to be more and more interesting ideas such as this. Um, this is all from my side. Thank you everyone for joining and listening. If you have some questions, um, I'll be glad to answer them. Otherwise, you can reach me by following information. Thank you.
I thank you. Um, it's very interesting. I'm just wondering, you have a relatively small data set. I mean, 400 samples is not too much. 10 features also not. Have you made any benchmarking on how much time you need for the data you have right now and how it's going to scale with more features and, and bigger, bigger tr yeah, more training samples? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, let's say this was like our initial point that we wanted to uh, make our research. And when taking into account that this data set uh, was relatively small because we also had computational resources not, uh, let's say, satisfied for a further search. Um, so this was roughly done on a, a PC, which was working for, let's say, 12 hours, roughly. Uh, but yeah, of course, the, what we are doing right now is to get more matrices and uh, experiments done for this method. And can you imagine any way on how you can simplify your approach for bigger data sets? If I can, how? If you can repeat the question. Do, do you have ideas already on how you're going to yeah, make it more scalable, for example, with more features? That you say you have ideas on how you can, can simplify it yeah. without losing your, your, your power? Yeah, let, let's say, okay. Because this was also the main question what the human uh, expert is doing, right? When the data set is becoming larger and larger. It's the same for this method, uh, which is using this nature and sparse algorithm to try to optimize the way which features to choose, how the autoencoder is formed. So roughly, I would say that we are comparing like if it, the human being is able to build something, if the machine can build it faster. Um, so. Yes, I, I agree. The, what I mean is, do you have, for, for the approach you're using right now, do you have an idea on how you can make it more suitable for, for more features, for example, whether there is any, just, you, you don't have to answer yeah. this right now, it's more like maybe but keep in mind. For the yeah, well, so another one that we wanted to add was basically a feature extraction tool, uh, but the whole problem currently, let's say with the method is that it needs to repeat the entire circle of selecting something, searching in a search space, uh, designing the autoencoder and then train it uh, until it gets the results. Uh, so this becomes like a, a huge time consuming time loop. Um, so valid question. Uh, we're still working on it. Uh, uh, any further? Yeah. So actually interesting. I want to ask you actually in your framework, you mentioned you only handle the the numeric data sites, right? Then how about the category data sites? Because I was working on the medical, the health, health related research also. I know actually they have a lot of category uh, features also. So uh, I'm not so clear. This one question, second one, actually you mentioned you split your training data set and uh, the test data set with tree one. So what's the reason? And do you have to use other some linear regression to try to find what's the optimal the split the uh, ratio. Okay. Split. Yeah, that will be one of the hyperparameters which was not, let's say, chosen in our let's say experiment that we done. But because we designed this method that you can set the search space, here you can define the hyperparameters that you're gonna use. So it's a simply let's say a configuration script where you add okay, uh, instead of let's say activation function, try to search for train split ratio. Okay, uh, then how about the category data size? Do you have the category features or category, category? Once means, uh, for example, now we are in the Sophia and yeah. uh, CT, or maybe we have oh, other the category. Uh, category. Okay. Yeah. Currently, it's only working for numerical. Numerical only. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Okay, so actually, just now, I sorry, I didn't see your slides about the operation part because the screen is keep on refreshing. So because for us, we use we use a lot of decision tree, actually. Uh, so are you using decision tree related to the algorithm or using some other regression to you when you do the classification? Yeah. Uh, so classification so side, yeah. The classification part, how we do it. So right now, this method is intended to just build uh, the model. Okay. All the parts are then can be taken forward with some other, uh, let's say, classification. 
Thank you very much. Greg. Yes, hello. Uh, just a very short question for me. Um, maybe you already mentioned it uh, and I just missed it in your presentation, but uh, does your like uh, objective or fitness function also consider the quality of the compression? So uh, basically somehow the ratio of the size of the latent layer inside inside the autoencoder uh, versus the input? Uh, very good question. So this is something I believe I missed in this presentation, but the complexity is built from let's say the compression that you mentioned, number of layers, and how many epochs does it take to train it. Mm -hmm. But because it's a fitness function, you can modify it for your needs. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we, we do have online questions, so we will try to uh, bring them. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, I, I, I have a uh, uh, a small question yeah. uh, uh, regarding the uh, uh, application domain. You, uh, you uh, mentioned the uh, the diabetes uh, uh, study, and uh, uh, for me, uh, it's always uh, uh, this question that if you do this kind of uh, neural network or any other. Uh, uh, model that is uh, well not exactly transparent. Uh, how do you uh, convince uh, the doctors who are ultimately be the uh, users that that it actually works? Yeah. So here the question comes again: how successful the final model is going to be? Um, but here in our research, we just wanted to build up the method used for, uh, let's say, given use case. In this case, we have gone for this diabetes dataset, but it could also be uh, used for something else. Hello. He is saying something, but we cannot hear. Uh, please try to uh, pose that question in the in the chat box. Uh, maybe. Okay, I think I understand what the question is. So here, when I mentioned the hands-free, it's in a way uh, for a construction phase of autoencoder um, because it's then also the uh, method which is taking uh, this problem into an account. It's hands-free in designing phase of autoencoder, but of course you still need to set up some parameters for our method. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm reading, I'm reading. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, to set up the parameters for uh, algorithms that are finding this uh, solution, um, we are using the NeoPy framework, which already does the heavy lifting of setting up these uh, parameters. Um, so mostly you just need to put the arguments, um, what's the dimension of the problem and the fitness function. Uh, for the adopted server iterations, yeah, yeah. iterations I have mentioned uh, that there have been 100, with two runs, which means that we run everything two times per algorithm. But second question, I, I don't understand. Uh, I, as far as far as I understand, uh, it's a question whether you uh, tested that uh, for statistical significance and so on. Uh, yeah, this this is something that yeah was not done in this work. Uh, well, thank uh, then, thank you very much. Uh...